and welcome to my lecture number 14. Today we want to ask the question, is it possible to stop global warming or even to reverse it? This should be the aim of our lecture and let's see what is possible and what not. So let's look at one of the latest reports from the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change. And they have a special report about the question, can we reduce the global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius? We have learned about all the possible feedback mechanisms and how dangerous the situation of our planet is. And even if we limit our global warming to 2 degrees of Celsius, it's not really sure if we can stay inside of a stable situation. And even with 2 degrees of Celsius, uh, the effects on our societies are already quite large. Therefore, the aim now is to limit our global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius because there, from all the detailed calculations, the situation seems to be rather safe. So here you see a plot about several scenarios which limit the temperature increase to about 1.5 degrees Celsius. As all the calculations, there are certain uncertainties and the uncertainties are shown here as the big bands which you see. So you see the temperature rise as it happened until today. And if you look to the right side of the diagram, you see how it will continue under certain measures which are discussed in this report. So depending on the scenario, it goes around this 1.5 degrees Celsius, but it should always stay below 2 degrees. So we don't want to do all these details. For the details, I refer you to read the reports and to look at the detailed calculations. The aim of my lecture here is mainly to understand basic facts and to understand the orders of magnitude and the relations between the causes and the effects. So let's first look at what has to be done to achieve these predictions here. So as you all know, global warming is caused by fossil fuel combustion and this produces CO2 and the CO2 emissions are shown on the diagram here. You see how they rise and it's clear to stop global warming, the CO2 emissions have to be stopped. So what is assumed in the report as a necessity to reduce global warming to this 1.5 degrees? Well, you see it on this diagram here. The CO2 emission have to be radically reduced. This has to be done in a rather fast, rapid drop down of the emissions until the year 2055 or better in the new report now until 2040. So that is what has to be realized. And of course, as a naive physicist, if you look at the curve, you would of course say, how will it continue in future? Well, it will continue to rise according to this hand-drawn line approximately. So how do we go from this steep rise to this steep drop? Well, that is a question of politics and you all know if you are realistic, um, it's hard to believe that it will happen, but it has to happen. And so we have to do drastic measures. This year was not so bad because of the Corona crisis. There was some drop of the emissions, but of course, it's hard to believe that after the Corona crisis, the drop of CO2 emissions will continue to go down as fast. But this is one of the prerequisites what we have to do in any case. If you look at the next plot here, you see what these emissions do to the CO2 in our atmosphere. So these are the accumulated CO2 emissions. And you see this continuous rise stops and goes to an equilibrium if we stop the new emissions. And the level of this equilibrium, of course, depends on when we start and how fast we start to stop the emissions. So it's clear the earlier we do it, the better it is, because what is emitted into this atmosphere will stay there for hundreds of years. So we cannot count on a reduction of the CO2 contents of the atmosphere anymore in the near future. It will only increase, but we will come to that in the next part of the lecture. We also should not forget other gases that also are greenhouse gases. 
and for that there you see on the third plot what happens if we also reduce those or if we don't reduce those in future. So it's clear to reduce global warming we also have to stop emitting methane into the atmosphere at least we should try to reduce it. Whereas on the previous plots the scale was given in gigatons per year. Now the scale is given as radiative forcing. So this is in, measured in watts per square meter. That's the reason for the different scale of the plot. As I mentioned before, the calculations about the temperature rise in future have certain uncertainties and big uncertainties come from the feedback loops. I explained you already before, if the global warming continues and the oceans get warmer and warmer, at some point the oceans will emit CO2. Because you know, if you have, for example, mineral water and you warm it up, the CO2 comes out of it and the same happens also in the ocean. Another feedback mechanism is the emission from land use change, desertification and forest fires. So the warmer it is, the more forest fires, the more desertification and the more of the biomass on the land is destroyed and that all this biomass produces CO2 which goes into the atmosphere. And another important feedback mechanism is the outgassing of methane when the permafrost regions start to melt. And of course, if the warmer it is, the more methane goes into the atmosphere and the stronger is the greenhouse effect of the methane. So all these effects show you that even if you do a nice calculation and you change one or two of these parameters, like the amount of methane which is generated in the permafrost areas, as soon as you change them, the response can change drastically because it is magnified by the positive feedback mechanisms. So in this context, with all the uncertainties and the dangers which are coming up, the big question now is, is it possible that we don't only stop the accumulation of CO2 in the atmosphere, but can we even reduce the CO2? To reduce the CO2 in the atmosphere, we have to artificially take out CO2 out of the atmosphere, because otherwise uh, this will stay at a constant level for hundreds of years, as I said before. To understand that a bit better, we go back to our somewhat complicated diagram from lecture 12. In lecture 12, we studied the global carbon cycle and we said we have two deposits. On the left one, you see the CO2 deposit and on the right one, you see the carbon deposit. And only if we are able to put CO2 from the deposit one to the deposit two, we can reduce the CO2 in the atmosphere. So let's focus now first on the natural cycle. So there we learned that the atmosphere contains CO2, that photosynthesis and solar power generate biomass. All the plants that grow take out CO2 out of deposit 1 and put it to biomass in deposit 2. This was a situation which is in an equilibrium. So as much as there is growing, there will be rotting or burning of the biomass so that on the long scale this process shows an equilibrium. In lecture 7 I showed you the rise of CO2 in the atmosphere as it is measured on a station in Hawaii. And there you saw this rise and the rise is due to the anthropogenic emission of CO2. If you just naively as a physicist draw a fitting line to this curve, you see the anthropogenic CO2 emission, so the increase of CO2 in the atmosphere, is on the order of about 2.4 ppm per year. So that is the approximate rise of the CO2 in the average over the last few years. Now if you look at the details, you see all these wiggles. And the wiggles are shown in large here for one of the last years in this additional panel here in the diagram. The scale below is the number of the month. 
So what you see is until about May CO2 concentration in the atmosphere rises. Then it drops down until about September, October and then it goes up again. So this variation happens every year and the reason for that is clear. In the summer there's a lot of plants growing, they produce a lot of biomass and the carbon for the biomass comes out of the CO2 from the atmosphere. And in fall the trees drop their leaves and things get rotted and then the bacteria in the ground produce again CO2 out of the biomass. This is the yearly procedure. The reason why you see it in Hawaii is the following one. Naively you would expect that you only see it in half of the globe because when there is summer in the northern half, there is winter in the southern half, so in principle those two processes compensate each other. But the point is that on the northern half there is more land and therefore there is more vegetation than on the southern half of the globe. The point what you see in this fluctuation here is not the production in the northern or southern half of the planet, but it's a difference of production and consumption of CO2. If you look at the thing quantitatively, you see that every year in the summer the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere drops by about 6 ppm. The real consumption of CO2 by the vegetation is much higher. The 6 ppm is only the difference between the northern and the southern half of the planet. Why do I show you this plot? Well, the interesting thing for me is that this 6 ppm per year is bigger than this 2.4 ppm per year. What does it mean? Well, it means that the amount of CO2 which we put into the atmosphere is much smaller than the amount of CO2 which is taken out of the atmosphere by the plants. So that even in the average between north and south half of the planet, there's still a slope of 6 ppm per year, which is about a factor of 2 to 3 larger than the anthropogenic rise. So what does it mean for our global carbon cycle? Well, the aim is to get CO2 out of the atmosphere back to the deposit 2. This works by photosynthesis and we just learned that photosynthesis is quantitatively much more than the anthropogenic emission of CO2. But the problem is that due to rotting and burning, the biomass which is produced every spring and every summer uh, is put back into the global cycle of rotting and burning. This comes in addition to the fossil fuel which we as humans put back into the atmosphere. So to reduce the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, we first of all have to stop combustion. Also CCS is not an option as we learned in one of the last lectures. But now the question in this lecture is, is it possible to stop also the biomass from rotting and burning? And for that I showed you already in the last lecture one of the options. The first option is that we use biomass for construction. And I explained it already in lecture 12. There is a possibility that we do our construction with wood mainly. So we could build houses and skyscrapers, furniture and a lot of other things which we daily need with a bigger content of wood as a combined material, for example with concrete or something else. And of course we could in addition also construct a lot of other things out of natural material like cellulose and so on. By doing so, it is possible to stop the biomass, so this fraction of the biomass which we use for construction and production, to stop this part of the biomass from rotting and burning for hundreds of years or so. So this would be a first option to take out CO2 out of the atmosphere. So the footprint of a house made out of wood is negative, so all that of course 
works only if the forest is reforestated after you use the wood. Of course, using materials for construction like houses and so on is something which is in the total volume somewhat limited. So to say it simply, as soon as all houses are made out of wood, there's no further possibility to take out CO2 by the usage of wood. Therefore, we come now to the next point, which is to my mind much more important for the question of global warming. And this goes with the keyword pyrolysis. So pyrolysis is one of my favorite things. And before I studied these climate problems, I didn't even really know what pyrolysis is. Therefore, I would like to explain it for you in a bit more detail now. As you remember from lecture 12, the reason why we want to use pyrolysis is with pyrolysis you can produce black carbon. So it's basically a method to produce coal, like charcoal, from biomass. And if you then sequestrate this black carbon, you take the CO2 out of the atmosphere, as shown in this diagram. But so let's now study in more detail what pyrolysis is about. In the previous lectures, we learned that life, so all biomass, mainly consists out of the chemical elements C, H and O, carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. Then there's some nitrogen and sulfur and a few other elements. So what happens if I burn biomass? Well, combustion means you add oxygen, you oxidize the material. So if you put oxygen to biomass, the carbon becomes CO2, the hydrogen becomes water vapor, the oxygen is used by the oxidation itself, and then in addition, depending on the material you have, you can produce a little bit of carbon monoxide, CO, which is a very dangerous gas, and every year many people die because if they have an oven at home or a fire and there's too much CO coming out, it's a very fast and quick death, which they suffer from. Then, because of the nitrogen, for example, in your amino acids, you also produce all kind of NOx. This is also bad for your health. And of course, the combustion is an exotherm reaction, so there's energy coming out at the end. And this energy is also often the reason why you do the combustion. I'm not a chemist. But we should still look a little bit more into the chemical formulas here. So the combustion of hydrogen is H2 plus oxygen goes to water. And there quite a big amount of energy is released. And this is of course also the reason, as we will see later in the lectures, why hydrogen in the future might play a big role in energy. So it's 572 kilojoule per mole, which come out of this reaction. <clears throat> the next reaction is the burning of the carbon. Carbon plus oxygen gives CO2 mainly. And here you also get energy, but not quite as much as for hydrogen. And actually, as a physicist, of course, you subtract these two equations. And then what comes out is that you can even use CO2 and hydrogen to produce energy. So CO2 plus hydrogen gives water vapor and pure carbon. And this reaction also is exotherm, so it releases the difference of the two numbers above. So this is the normal combustion. And now to go from combustion to pyrolysis is easy. The only thing you have to do is you limit the oxidation. So you have a limited amount of oxygen in the reactions and you go to a certain high temperature. It must be high enough that the reactions run, but also not too high. And now what happens? Well, you have in the biomass the carbon and the hydrogen as the main materials, in addition to the oxygen. And both of them want to oxidize, and both of them want to burn. But, of course, the hydrogen is stronger. There's more energy released by the hydrogen. So the binding is stronger of the hydrogen to the oxygen. So by a limited amount of oxygen, then only the oxidation of the hydrogen happens. So you only produce water vapor. 
and the carbon cannot oxidize because there's no oxygen left for the carbon. So what happens, the biomass in, is basically converted into pure carbon plus water vapor plus energy which is released. So what do we have to remember? First of all, pyrolysis is exotherm. So if you do pyrolysis, you don't have to use energy, but you gain energy. Secondly, you add oxygen and what comes out at the end is water vapor plus of course some smoke because of all the other chemical elements, for example, which are in the biomass. But the main thing which comes out is pure carbon, so you can produce pure carbon or coal out of biomass using pyrolysis. So in principle it's a very simple process, the pyrolysis, even if the name is complicated. And everybody can do it and most of you probably have done that already. So you can in principle take any biological material. Normally people use wood, but you can also take another type of biomass. Then you take this biomass like here in this picture, you take a pizza, you heat it up and you make sure that there's not too much, much oxygen around. So what happens, the pizza gets hot and hotter and hotter. And if you let it in the oven for some time, it will look like that here. What you actually have produced is basically pure carbon. So in a way it is coal, but not really coal, of course. If you do that in detail, you learn that in addition in pyrolysis, that it's not always solid, but depending on the process and the material, there are also kind of oils and tar coming out. But this is all chemistry, which is well understood. The nice thing of pyrolysis is you can do it with all material. You can use wood, as I said, you can use any kind of biomass, so you can use waste from agriculture for it. You can actually also take industrial products, or if you take a plastic, which does not contain any dangerous materials, you can also do pyrolysis with the plastic. And actually there are toilets which convert your excrements into kind of charcoal. So even with that, you can do pyrolysis and what comes out is something which is basically coal, which is also not infectious anymore because of the high temperatures. So this is a method where you can do a lot with. In case of the burnt pizza, of course, if you still are hungry, it doesn't help you to eat this carbon, but I still have a solution for you. You just take another organic material, you use the carbon to make fire, as, a, as you use charcoal on your grill, and this way you still get something for eat. But now let's be serious again. Pyrolysis is one of the oldest human crafts. There's the profession of the char burner. So the char burner or charcoal burner is not the person at the grill who is burning the charcoal, but it's the person who burns wood to produce charcoal. It's shown here in the picture how you do it. You take a big pile of wood, you surround it by soil, for example. This allows you to stop the oxygen from going inside. And then you put fire to it. Then it takes some time where the oxidation of the pyrolysis is going on. As I told you, this is an exotherm process, so you don't need energy from outside. There are a few things which could go wrong, of course. If you put too much oxygen into the pyrolysis, then everything burns, including the carbon, then all the charcoal at the end is burned and there is nothing left from your process. The other thing which can go wrong is that the amount of oxygen is such that there is quite some carbon monoxide produced. Then the person in charge of it can die from it because if you breathe it, you get sick and you get and you can even die from it. But otherwise, it's a quite simple technology. So at the end, you have a big pile of charcoal. The charcoal has been used in former times, of course, mainly like you do it in your grill to have an easy way of fire. Charcoal is much lighter than wood, for example, and it burns differently. 
So it's very useful for cooking and all kind of other stuff. At some point, the people started also to use it for industrial purposes. For example, for the production of iron, you can very well use this charcoal. But that is not my point now. We have in mind to do pyrolysis at large scale. So the first thing is to think about, is it dangerous to do so? Here the easiest answer is the following. Pyrolysis happens also naturally. If there's a forest fire, a lot of the wood is not completely burned down, but there's just pyrolysis happening. The wood is black afterwards, so it's converted into charcoal. This charcoal is mixed with the ground, and there are areas on our planet where there is quite a few of carbon in the ground, and we see in these areas there is no negative effect on agriculture and plants. So if we do pyrolysis and we put the carbon into the ground, that should not be negative for our biosphere. The next important thing, and this is really very important, I think, for our future, people have discovered that already thousands of years ago, some people say more than 6,000 years ago, but certainly more than 2,000 years ago, the Indians in the Amazon buzzer were using pyrolysis. So people have found that in these areas there are regions where the ground is very black. They call it terra preta. And this terra preta in the middle of the jungle is very fertile. So the Indians, a long time ago, they knew that if they produced charcoal and they mixed it with excrement and put it into the ground, that then the ground, which was usually a very poor soil in the jungle, became very fertile and you could use it very well for agriculture. This was very important for the Indians because we know nowadays that they had big cities and huge populations in an area where there is not growing so much, and especially at a time when there were no artificial or industrial fertilizers. So they replaced that by using terra preta. And this is a proposal what we also can do in future, which means we have to reinvent agriculture. And today we know very well that black carbon has a lot of advantages for agriculture. The first one and very important one is that it improves the water retention of the soil. This is especially important in areas where the soil is dry and where the rainfalls are coming only irregularly. And if they come, they can be strong. So then the soil sucks up the water. And if you have this terra preta, this works much better than if you have only sand and other things in the ground. It has also been studied that the fertility of the soil is improved. Especially microorganisms can live better if they have this charcoal. The charcoal has the property that it has a very large surface. You know, for example, that you use certain kinds of coals for gas masks so that you absorb material in it. And in a similar way, this also works for charcoal. This also helps to reduce the washing out of nutrition out of the soil. So you, in principle, need less fertilizer also. And the charcoal accepts gases. The amount of emission of methane and N2O, for example, are reduced and it can also help when the soil is acid, so it helps to neutralize the pH value. So all these are big advantages, and I think there has to be much more studies on how to use terra preta-like soil, so how to use charcoal for the agriculture to improve your soil. So this brings me already to the end of this lecture. So let's summarize the main messages of this lecture. The aim is to stop and even reverse global warming. And for that, we have clear statements what has to be done. The first, of course, is we have to stop fossil fuels and we also have to stop other greenhouse gases like methane to be emitted into the atmosphere. 
This will be very difficult and we have to put very much effort in it because it has a big effect on our whole industry. It has of course also to do with agriculture because you know the production of methane is also related to our meat industry, so the growing of cows and there have to be a lot of changes to be done. The next important point is to do reforestation and recultivation. So in this sense, we can increase the amount of biomass on our planet and this works very easy and very cheap. We just have to have programs for that and already in many countries there are big programs of reforestation where the people grow hundreds and thousands of new trees. On the other hand, you know, in other parts of the planet, people still burn down the rainforest and other areas. So if we go further in this direction, we also have to think about reversing desertification. There are many areas nowadays where there was forest before and where there is desert today. And there are ways to recultivate also the deserts. And to that we come in the coming lecture. The main problem here, of course, is water and the next lecture we will talk about the water cycle, the global water cycle. Then we discussed to keep biomass from rotting. We should use biomass for construction on a big scale. So build more houses out of wood and more other things out of natural materials. And now we come to the last point, which to me is very important, which is the black carbon sequestration. So you put black carbon into the ground and this way you finally take out CO2 out of the atmosphere. To do so, you can use pyrolysis. Normally you take pyrolysis from wood. So you have a sustainable forest where you grow trees and the trees can be cut regularly and converted into charcoal. But of course, you also can do it with any kind of biomass, especially bio waste from agriculture. You can do it with feces and you can even do it with plastic from industrial production. The nice thing of pyrolysis is that it's exotherm, so you also gain energy out of that. It's nothing where you have to put in energy to produce it. The next important point is that you can use biochar in agriculture. You have to rethink agriculture in a way where the contents of biochar in the ground helps you to grow things, to use less fertilizers and to have a better usage of the water which is available. And finally, if you have done all that and there are still options to do pyrolysis, then you can bury it anywhere, basically everywhere in the ground it's possible. It should not have a negative effect in most of the areas. And finally, you can even put it into the deserts and bury it there. The only missing thing now is the question um, how to do it practically. And if you look back at the development of CCS, where there have been millions of research money going in there by companies and by governments and the companies are promised that for every ton of CO2 which they store somewhere they get some money, an increasing amount of money even. Then the question is why is that not done? Well up to now the legislation is so that it's not allowed to pay for black carbon sequestration. This has to be changed and one has to find an attractive incentive so that the people like to do this pyrolysis, there has to be regulations about it. So one should get money for doing that, for doing pyrolysis. Today in many areas it's even forbidden to do pyrolysis because what people do nowadays is they cut trees in areas where trees are urgently needed and they use the wood to do charcoal which they then just use for cooking and for burning. It's understandable that the governments try to prohibit that, but we have to find a way to do pyrolysis and charcoal in a sustainable and renewable fashion. And this should be possible and this should in principle be much cheaper than CCS because the technology is simple. It can be done by any farmer, any worker in any country and we just have to improve the technology for it and also to prepare the funding for that.
So this to my mind is a good option for the future. Next lecture we will talk about the global water cycle and we also talk about the reversion of desertification. And then finally we go to our main subject which is renewable energies. So thank you again for listening and hope to see you next time again. Goodbye. Thank you.